All right, Sven Brinkman, welcome to the show. Thank you. So you are the author of two books that I've really enjoyed. They're thought-provoking. It's gotten me thinking about big ideas in a different way, which I always appreciate. The first one is Stand Firm, and the second one is Stand Points. And we're going to focus on Stand Points. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before that, let's talk a bit about Stand Firm. In Stand Firm, you describe our current age as liquid modernity. What do you, what do, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? Yeah, it's a phrase I take from the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, who uh, died not that many years ago, and uh, he was a fantastic author. He lived to be in his 90s. He was in, um, you know, World War II and and fled from, he was a Jew, so he fled to the the UK and worked as a sociologist there. And, And he developed this account of our times based on the idea that things have become fluid, they have become liquid, and he called it liquid modernity, in order to distinguish it from a more uh, solid modernity, you know, with uh, industrial society, with sort of stable social norms, people knew what to do, they were perhaps also quite often caught in a certain social position that it was difficult to to, to escape from and so on. But then in the latter half of the 20th century, after the war, and especially after the countercultures of the 60s and 70s, the youth revolt, we developed, or they developed a consumer society, a liquid modernity, when, you know, even Marx uh, Karl Marx uh, predicted this in the 19th century when he said that with the advancement of capitalism, all that is solid melts into air. That's the famous phrase. All that is solid, solid melts into air. And, uh, and Bauman saw this, that it, everything had melted into air. Nothing was stable. Nothing was permanent. Everything was suddenly up to the, the individual. And the individual had to engage in, in constant self-optimization, self-improvement, self-development, work in learning organizations, be ready for lifelong learning, and so on and so forth. All of which, I should add, are processes that, that, that have a positive side. But when these things are constantly demanded of the individual, it's not really that positive. It's actually very difficult to live up to. And it creates stress and anxiety and depression in individuals. And it makes it very difficult to navigate as an ethical being, to navigate morally when, when everything solid is suddenly melded into air. I think all of us have felt that, that stress and that anxiety of like, mm-hmm. I've, I've got to, well, I got to lose weight and I've got to do this to get my job. And I got to, I got to be more positive because like some self-help books said that if I'm positive, like uh, my, it'll help me advance my career. I think we've all felt that. Yeah. I've been reviewing self-help books for a Danish uh, newspaper for quite some time. And, and so I, I began to, to look at liquid modernity in, in self-help literature, uh, how this actually how this is articulated in popular culture, in self-help books, and so on. And, of course, there are good self-help books, as within a genre. You know, there are good books and bad books. But I I think, uh, as a whole, the genre is a symptom of liquid modernity. We we tend to think, and these books tend to tell us, that we can solve our problems, that we can achieve whatever is worth achieving by following seven or, or ten simple steps. And and so actually stand firm. My own book was written as a parody of a self-help book. I see the book myself as a cultural critique, but I articulate this critique through the genre of the self-help book. And what I find particularly problematic about this supposed solution that we find in self-help books and so on to, to, the, to the problems of liquid modernity is that we can actually never succeed There's this trap built into the whole system that no matter how well we do, how much we perform, how much we engage engage in self-optimization, it's always temporary. Next week or next month or next year, we have to do something else. We have to be a little bit better. We have to run a little bit faster. We have to lose weight again or become happier, (laughs) fitter, more productive. Now I'm quoting a song by Radiohead, I believe. And, And so... When we discover this, it really creates a deep kind of despair 
that that I think is behind uh, all these epidemics of stre- stress, depression, and anxiety that we see all across the the Western world, even in a rich country like like my own in Denmark. We, we, we find, I mean, epidemics of these mental problems. And, and of course, this is a, a very complex problem, but I think much of it has to do with what Bauman originally called liquid modernity. And, and I also think the, pro- the problem with self-help too is, and you, you articulate this in the book, is that I think what people fundamentally want, they want a sense of significance and meaning. Mm. And self-help says, well, if you do these things, you will find significance and meaning, but it's all inward turning. You have to look, you have to find that meaning within yourself. But as you, you make the case, like that's impossible to do. Like it, it, it you might find something, but it's not going to, it's going to be fleeting and then you'll have to like look for it again inside yourself. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we're all, or at least uh, many of us are looking for something more stable under these conditions of liquid modernity. But I think it's misguided to look for the stable ground of our lives within ourselves because we are co- we're constantly exposed to you know all sorts of trends and fads and commercials and whatever and you know these things constantly change and we want new things and we are never really satisfied with what we have that is sort of the motor of consumer society and so when self help tells us to look inside to to feel within ourselves what is right and wrong it tells us to to look in a place that is really not that stable. And so I think this just adds to the tragedy. And I think we need to understand what, that we should look, in a way, away from ourselves. We should look at the society we're in, the culture we're in, the, the traditions that we are part of, the relationships that we engage in, the, the people that we have obligations toward, and so on and so forth. All these things that are in a sense, outside of ourselves, I think that is where we can find more stable values and demands that that actually uh, can serve as coordinates in our lives as an antidote, if you will, to to the constant liquidity, liquidity of, of, of of our times. Well, speaking of that idea, that mantra that you hear nowadays, look within, you know, find your values inside yourself. I think you quoted a psychologist or philosopher where he said, well, what if you introspect and you find nothing's there? <laughs> yeah. And, and you didn't you didn't yeah. find anything there to to base your life on. Yeah, there is a very intelligent US psychologist called Philip Cushman and he has a, a, a famous article from the early 90s actually when these problems really began to emerge and, and his piece is called why the self is empty. <laughs> and it's sort of a critique of this tendency in the western world to look for value, meaning, and purpose within ourselves. And he says, when we constantly look within ourselves, we eventually discover that the self is empty. There is not that much in there. And if there is, well, then it's constantly changing. And then we become desperate and we begin to fill up this emptiness You know, constantly going to see the therapist, constantly going to see the life coach, constantly buying new stuff that should fill this emptiness. And in a way, the the only solution is to understand that, well, maybe we shouldn't look inside ourselves all the time. I mean, I mean, of course, it's it's not something (laughs) that should be forbidden. It's something we we can do from time to time. But I think as 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 something that should you know lay the ground for our existence. I think it's inadequate and we would be wiser to look at all the things that we're part of. Perhaps it's not that important to be able to answer the question, who am I? What is inside me? Perhaps it's more important to be able to answer the question, what am I part of? What am I obliged to do? What are my commitments as a human being within these relationships that I'm part of? So uh, your second book, Standpoints, talks about some of these outside commitments that we can live, you know, stand firm or standpoints that we can stand firm on. And we'll talk about these here in a bit, but another interesting thing you do in standpoints that you describe modern life, not only as liquid modernity, but it's also, it's become completely instrumental. What do you, what do you mean by, what do you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, the term instrumentalism is connected in a way to what we just talked about as liquid Modernity, And it means simply that much of what we do 
that perhaps used to have intrinsic value. And that means that it used to be something that we should do and would like to do for its own sake. But that has now become a tool or, or an instrument. And that's what, that, that's what the term instrumentalization covers. So we no longer do X because X is intrinsically valuable. We do X in order to achieve Y. <laughs> and then we do Y in order to achieve Z and so on and so forth. And so everything has become, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but we can <laughs> be more concrete later. Everything almost has become a stepping stone to something else. And so we never really experience intrinsic meaning. Or if we do, we are constantly in doubt whether it's okay, whether we are wasting our time, because shouldn't we be doing something useful, something that will take us to the next stage or the next step or, or, or whatever in our development plans. So, so that's the problem of instrumentalism. It exercises meaning from our life, from our lives, because meaning is connected to that which is intrinsically meaningful and intrinsically valuable. And then, of course, the big question is, what is intrinsically meaningful and, and valuable? And the book is actually about that question. Well, before we get to that question, like, what are some ex- like insidious examples of instrumentality in modern life where like people don't realize they're being instrumental, but mm. they are? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I try to provide a lot of examples from different areas of life. And sadly, they're very easy to, to think of. For example, to begin with my own sort of local life in, in the institutions that I'm part of, we have public universities in Denmark, and I'm part of that. And we used to have independent universities that saw knowledge as an end in itself. I mean, we should develop knowledge in order to be wiser in order to find out more about the world that we live in. And, and now universities are increasingly controlled by political goals that say that, well, we should develop knowledge that will help us increase our gross national product, that will help us become more, you know, effective, be able to beat the Chinese in the global competition for, for market shares and so on. We should, and, and that, that, leaves, you know, so many forms of knowledge without a chance, <laughs> knowledge of ancient Greek, knowledge of uh, French culture, uh, you know, philosophy, whatever, because it, it isn't really something that, that uh, can boost the, the, the gross national product of the country. So knowledge is no longer an end in itself, but more seriously, or more, you know, at least in an ethical sense, more, more problematic is that when we begin to to approach human relationships instrumentally, when we begin to think of friendship as something that is a, a tool for, for the individual's success. If you look at, I mean, we call them friends, the connections we have on, on Facebook. Instead of a circle of friends, we now have LinkedIn connections and so on. And what are these relations? Well, they are basically sort of empty relations that I can mobilize, for example, on LinkedIn, if I want to advance in my career. And that is not a proper friendship. I mean, friendship, if you have a friend, you will be there for the other, regardless of what you sort of can take away from that. I mean, um, or, or, or get out of it. A friend is not an instrumental person in your life. A, a friend is some someone you will help regardless of, you know, any ulterior gains you, you may get from that. Love relationships, I mean, romantic relationships have also increasingly become instrumentalized. We, we, we navigate in our love life, uh, according to the question. So who is right for me? Who will realize me and myself to the greatest possible extent? How can I really commit? To another person, if I always have this question in my in the back of my mind, could there be someone else who is better, <laughs> who's a better tool, basically, in the project of making me happy? And and I mean, these are just some examples of instrumentalism, which is I think so prevalent in our culture that it, it's in, in a way actually quite difficult to talk about because it's so basic now. It's more or less our basic outlook on life and other people. 
No, when I read that idea about instrumental, I started thinking about other ways I've seen it prop up, particularly in the self-help genre, because like I'm guilty of this as myself, like when I've written articles on our website, like you need to do this thing because of this. Like one was like gratitude, right? It's not long, yeah. you're, you're, you should be grateful just to be grateful. It's the right thing to do. It's well, well no, it makes you feel better, increases your health, it reduces stress. The other one was like play, right? You yeah. know, like kids should play because it helps them increase their math scores. Well, we used to be like, kids should just play because you should play. It's fun. You just do it because it's fun. It's a fundamental human value to play. And now uh, in schools, you know, they have play curricula that uh, exactly as you say, as opposed to to boost the pupils' math scores, you know, linguistic competencies or, or whatever. And, you know, even these very particular human phenomena that we don't see in other living creatures, at least that we're aware of, for example, forgiveness. There's a chapter about forgiveness in the book, and I th- I find this a most fascinating topic. But when you look at how forgiveness is treated in the self-help literature, and even by, you know, serious psychologists, it's almost always instrumentalized. And I mean by that, that people are encouraged to forgive others because it will make them feel better. It will, you know, set them free and they can live their lives in a different and more productive way and so on and so forth. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. that that's very good. But it's not really the forgiveness then. I mean, if we forgive the other in order to benefit from that ourselves, then it's not really forgiveness. Then it's like a trade on a market. I forgive you in order to achieve this myself. But really, if you think about it, forgiveness, if it even exists, and that's an open question, but if it exists as a human phenomenon, forgiveness, then it's a gift. It's something you give unconditionally. And, and, and that is characteristic of, of all these phenomena that I call standpoints, all these phenomena that have intrinsic values. They are unconditional. If we put them into a calculus and ask, so what do, what, what's in it for me to forgive? What's in it for me to love? What's in it for me to, to live in a way that protects the, the intrinsic dignity of the other person and so on? Then we really reduce these human values to, to instruments for our own purposes. And, and I think that is, in a way, I don't want to be too dramatic, but in a way, it's a form of ethical violence, I, I believe. And you also make the case that this instrumentality leads to, can, can lead to nihilism or nihilism. Yeah. There is a very interesting philosopher, Simon Critchley. He's at the New School of Social Research in New York City, originally from the UK. But he he writes about these things. And and I, I found in his work this distinction between two kinds of nihilism. One is, well, well, nihilism is the theory, if you will, or the belief that nothing ultimately has value. If there is value in the world, it's something we subjectively project onto the world. The world itself is just, you know, matter in motion or, you know, it's like, you know, Woody Allen would talk about, you know, existential philosophers would talk about the world is absurd. There's no value in the world. It's all meaningless, right? But so we, we cannot live like that. And, and then the, uh, the, the philosophical tradition of, of nihilism and existentialism will say that we have to create value. And we do that subjectively, exactly by looking into ourselves and and then projecting this value onto the world. And and then Simon Critchley makes this distinction between two kinds of nihilism. One is active. And it says that, well, values have been destroyed by, I don't know, modern society, capitalism, yeah, modernity, whatever. And then we have to, you know, actively create value together. In the most extreme case, this is done through revolutions, you know, like in in communism or terrorism, as in, you know, Islamic terror and so on, where they try to create a certain order in the world that has meaning. Of course, for most of us, fortunately, uh, this is not an option. We are neither um, uh, Islamic terrorists or communists or anything like that. So for us, the option is what Critchley calls uh, passive nihilism. And that is about creating meaning exactly through what you talked about before, this inward looking movement. I create meaning by finding out what is important for me, 
what feels right for me. And if it feels right for me, then it is right. And then I am allowed and I should be encouraged to project that onto the world as such. And I find out about what is right for me through mindfulness or life coaching or meditation or psychotherapy or any other kinds of, you know, techniques of self discovery, self improvement and, and happiness that we have available in the modern world. And the point is that this, at a first glance, it looks like something liberating. It's look, it looks as if it's emancipatory because it, it gives the individual so much power to create meaning and purpose. But Critchley would say, and I would agree with him and a host of philosophers and also psychologists are now sort of discovering that it's not really emancipatory. It's not liberating. It's actually the opposite because it makes us solely responsible for everything in our lives, which is unbearable. It's a form of despair, as my compatriot Søren Kierkegaard would say. And we become little gods in our own lives. And that is not really a good way of living for human beings. So again, we are back to the necessary search for alternatives. If we are not the sole creators of meaning, purpose, and value, if we cannot passively discover it within ourselves and create it, then how can we find it? Where can we look for it? And again, the answer must be that we should look for it in our relationships to something beyond ourselves, other people, nature, culture, history, tradition, all the important institutions in our democracies and so on. So let's talk about some of these standpoints. Mm -hmm. You start off with Aristotle, and I think you start off with him because he kind of lays the foundation for the rest of these, like he kind of, was like the father of anti-instrumentality. Yeah. What was his exactly. idea that you, that you took from him on how to stand firm on something firm? Well, well, to be a bit, to say it in a, in a, in a rather simple way, I would say Aristotle, who was a fantastic uh, thinker and scientist. I mean, in all the different disciplines, we have biology and physics and uh, chemistry and psychology and so on. And psychology, sorry, Aristotle uh, inaugurated in a way all these different scientific disciplines. And I would say that his greatest discovery, and in a way it's a discovery that is, you know, up there with, you know, Darwin's discovery of, of evolutionary processes and, um, uh, uh, Einstein and relativity theory, even though it sounds much more trivial, Aristotle discovered that there are certain things, certain values in the human world that are intrinsically valuable. He discovered that there are certain things we ought to do just in order to do them. And if we instrumentalize them, we really, well, uh, shoot ourselves in our feet, as we say. Let me give you an example. If, if we, walk by a river and we witness a, a small child who's about to drown in the river and we stand there considering should i really try to save this child the water looks so cold it looks very unpleasant for the child but it would also be unpleasant for me to jump in i don't know if i can do it am i brave enough what will i gain from doing it will i will it make me happier you know, there is research, serious research done in health psychology that supposedly uh, allegedly demonstrates that if you do such moral acts, you live longer. It lowers your blood pressure. And so if all these things become the reason why we should try and save the drowning child, then we instrumentalize the action. And Aristotle, sorry about the long digression. Now I'm getting back to your question. Aristotle discovered that there is only one legitimate answer to the question, why should I try to save the drowning child? And the answer is, well, if you don't do it, then the child will drown. That's the answer. And by that, he meant that the action, in a way, legitimizes itself, you know, and, and if we find a reason for doing it somewhere else outside the action, then we instrumentalize it. And we shouldn't do that. So that's the beginning with Aristotle. He would say, in all human activities, there are so many things we do in order to achieve something else. We don't go to the doctor because it's fun to go to the doctor. We go to the doctor because we want to be healthy. But health is a basic human value. 
we cannot really uh, ask, but, but why be healthy? No, because health is, health is just inter- intrinsically good. And, 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 and so his project became to develop an account of all the phenomena that exist in a human life that, uh, are intrinsically valuable. And, uh, he was very successful in doing that. He, uh, identified a whole lot. We have already talked about some of them. Friendship, for example. I, I would add, you know, democracy or trust or, of course, uh, for Aristotle also ethical action and so on and so forth. But that in project has sadly been, uh, well, forgotten is too strong because, of course, we have had philosophers working in, in this line of thought all the time. But I, I think in liquid modernity, with the rise of instrumentalism, it has really become difficult to pose this fundamental question, what is just valuable in itself? We tend to think that nothing is valuable in itself. It's just valuable because I choose that is valuable. But that's nihilism, and that's not going to help us. Yeah, Aristotle, I mean, has had a huge influence, not only on the world of philosophy, but also theology. I mean, he had a big influence on Aquinas, where Aquinas basically took Aristotle's idea of the good, like you do something because it's good in of itself, and, you know, said like, well, you do something because God says to do it, right? Because God is good, and you're going to follow him. And so you see that play out as well in the world of religion, too. Yeah, Aquinas is quite an interesting character. He tried to synthesize the Greek legacy, particularly from Aristotle, whom he simply referred to as the philosopher. I mean, Aristotle was just the philosopher, even though, you know, he, he knew about Plato and many other philosophers. Uh, Aristotle was the guy. But to uh, synthesize Aristotle and Christianity was the great project for Aquinas. And I mean, if you look at, I, I know that I'm a psychologist, but I also have a background in philosophy and I'm, I, I follow philosophy, academic philosophy. And if you look at all the philosophers working around the world, I mean, so few of them are now interested in in the questions that we now talk about, in the questions that Aristotle and Aquinas were interested in. Most of them work on, you know, little technicalities in modal logic or, you know, something about bioethics, whatnot. And all these things are important too. But my point is that most of us become interested in these questions in philosophy because we want to know how to live our lives. And, and I think philosophers really should return to those ancient questions because that is, that is really the reason why we have philosophy in order to help us address those questions. So, uh, Aristotle, you do good because it's good. Yeah. The second philosopher and an idea you took from him was Kant. And this is the idea of dignity. So what is? What is dignity and what does the instrumental view replace dignity with in the modern world? Yeah, for me, it's important that Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher of the Enlightenment, follows the chapter on Aristotle. Aristotle and other Greek philosophers were very clear that because humans have a unique kind of rationality, we're able to to fathom that certain things are intrinsically valuable. We should do the good in order to do the good and not in order to, do, to achieve anything else. We may achieve something else, but that's not the reason why we should do it. But the Greeks did not know that human beings are intrinsically valuable. And the term we traditionally use to address that is dignity, human dignity. I mean, Aristotle had slaves, women were not considered as, you know, rational beings that uh, one could really count on in in the Greek polis, and so in in the history of ideas, it's a revolution in our view of human beings, and probably Jesus was the first to talk about this, and and it it it, it entered philosophy in in different ways, but it's very clear in the Enlightenment with Immanuel Kant when he says that human beings have dignity, which means that we cannot trade humans. On a marketplace, we cannot think of human beings as creatures with, you know, a price that we can buy and sell. That is just totally wrong. Well, it's not totally wrong. I mean, for Kant, and I would agree with him, it's inevitable that we have an instrumental relationship to other people. That's okay. The problem is if we only have instrumental relationships to other people, as he would say, We should never treat other people exclusively as means, but also 
always also as an end in itself, as an end in themselves, right? So if I go and buy some milk in the shop, in a way, the, the person in the shop is an instrument that I use in order to, you know, buy my milk. And conversely, I am an instrument for the shopkeeper because I, 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 I give him or her some money. And so we have this, you know, uh, market relationship to each other. And that's perfectly fine. We engage instrumentally with each other. But let's say that the shopkeeper has a heart attack while I'm buying my milk. So I cannot get my milk. Then it's very disturbing because I wanted my milk. And so if I begin to shout in the shop and say, well, please give me a new shopkeeper because this one broke down. I need a new one so I can get my milk. Then I'm guilty of, well, insanity probably. But, but, and then the problem is also according to Bauman, with whom I began to talk about liquid modernity, that we have these instrumental relationships to other people in our times, which make, you know, the other just a tool for my, desires and preferences, the other becomes someone I should make use of in order to realize whatever wish I have to buy my milk, to become successful or happiness in life, to to make a career or whatever. And again, it's okay to have an instrumental relationship to others as long as it is grounded in a much more fundamental understanding of the other as and end in itself, as we all are. I mean, that is, we have human rights, we have civil rights, we have this fundamental understanding in our institutions, we should have, at least. Perhaps we, we, we are gradually losing it, unfortunately, but we should have this fundamental understanding that everyone has equal value just in virtue of being human, regardless of what we produce, of what we achieve, <laughs> of how beautiful we are, how rich we are, how successful we are. You know, regardless, we have equal value. That's a radical idea when you think it through. The Greeks did not have that idea. They thought that people had value relative to how well they did, right? And then Jesus, and I'm not talking about, you know, religion here. I'm not talking about metaphysics or a belief in in an... A, a god or something like that. I, I'm simply talking about the history of ideas when Jesus of Nazareth, Na, Nazareth came and said, it doesn't matter if you are a beggar or a prostitute or a king, I will eat with you because you're a human being and you're all, you all have equal value. That is a way of addressing human dignity that sort of cuts across all the differences that certainly exist between people and, and can't made this the fundamental principle of his ethics. And I think this is the jewel of what we consider Western philosophy. It, it might exist in other philosophical systems too. I don't know much about those, but in my opinion, it's certainly the jewel in, in, in the line of thought that runs, well, at least from the birth of, of Jesus through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and, and uh, up to our times. And we should do whatever we can to protect that jewel. Something that you touch on in the book, and I've noticed too after I read about this, read, read this chapter, was not only do we sometimes, not sometimes, but often treat others merely as a means um, and instrumentalize others, but we, we also do it to ourselves, right? We don't have a, like, there's like not a sense of self dignity, right? And you see this where people, yeah. I don't know, do things on social media to get attention, right? That's undignified. Yeah. And you're like, you look at it and you're like, oh man, why are you doing that, man? Like, that's. <laughs> don't do that. And like, and, and, but they're doing it because like they, it'll bring them value, it'll get them attention, which would hopefully lead to money and yeah. fame, whatever it is they think they want. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you talk about the fact that it will bring them attention. And I think that is very precise because attention has become how we really think of value today. If you can get attention almost, you know, regardless of why you get attention, then you have done something valuable, which when you think of it is a rather insane idea because you can get attention by, you know, doing all sorts of silly things or evil things by killing others or, or whatever. So we have this attention economy that is really, um, I would say dangerous and, and part of this whole system. And I think you're absolutely right. I, I haven't 
thought so much about that aspect and I haven't written about it. But this principle of dignity should certainly also be applied to ourselves. I, I have actually been interesting in the emotion of shame because shame is not a very popular emotion. It's certainly painful. It's one of the key emotions that function to regulate uh, social life. And, and we, we have, I'm talk, I talked about religion before. It, it figures already in Genesis, you know, when Adam and Eve begin to feel shame the moment they achieve self-consciousness because they have eaten from the tree of knowledge, from the forbidden fruit. So it's intimately connected to self-understanding uh, shame. And the danger we have now is well, one of the dangers, there are many, but one related to, 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 to this point is the danger of shamelessness. If we are not capable of feeling shame, but we will do anything to attract attention, then we no longer have dignity. And ultimately, we can no longer be moral beings because the, the capacity to feel shame when you do something, something shameful is fundamental to, to morality. And it's not, it's not a coincidence that, you know, an incapacity to feel guilt and shame is a key criterion for antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy or, or, or psychopathy. If psychopaths exist, I'm not an expert in that field, but if they exist, the key defect is, is probably this lack of, of, of shame. And so again, to return to, to the self-help world and, and, the idea of self-development, much of what goes on there is about learning to, to avoid shame, to, you know, not feel shame. <laughs> and I think this is very wrong because, well, of course, the, 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 the point is not that we should go around and, and, and feel ashamed all the time, certainly not, but we should have the capacity to feel shame and guilt and all the other moral emotions without which we... Uh, we, we, we couldn't be moral creatures. All right, so dignity is a standing standpoint. Mm -hmm. The next one you talked about that stuck out to me was uh, an idea you took from Nietzsche, which is interesting because Nietzsche, you know, I think uh, incorrectly is <laughs> believed to be sort of the father of nihilism and et cetera, but he wasn't. He actually had some really interesting ideas about what to do in this liquid modern world of ours. And one standpoint you took from him was the idea of promises. What, what can we learn about promises from Nietzsche? Yeah, I, I should say that I don't pretend to provide a complete interpretation of, well, neither Aristotle or Kant and, and certainly not Nietzsche. I, I admire much in Nietzsche. There's also much in his works that I disagree with. I think he's often misunderstood. As you said, people uh, read him as a nihilist. In, in, in reality, he saw the problem of nihilism in Western culture. He saw actually many of the problems because he was a genius more than a hundred years ago, uh, many of the problems that we now talk about. But I think he did not really come up with, with good solutions, if you will. But, but there is this passage in one of his books when he talks about the human being uh, as a creature with the right to make promises. And, and so I, I am interested in the role of promises in human life and in the conditions that must exist in order for such a wonderful thing as a promise to make sense in the first place. Other animals don't make promises. It's a unique human, uniquely human phenomenon. And uh, what is the precondition for promising something? Well, a promise only makes sense if you have what Another philosopher, a Frenchman called Paul Ricoeur, called self-constancy, right? Because if you're not the same person tomorrow when you are going to, you know, fulfill the promise as you were yesterday when you made the promise, then the practice of making promises is meaningless. But it isn't meaningless. It's a fundamental phenomenon in human life. It it, it, it's the basis of marriage, of contracts between people, you know, buying and selling stuff. We, we, we make promises to each other. I made the promise to you uh, some time ago to be available today. And let's say that I had a different uh, idea. I didn't really feel like talking to anyone today. I would rather 
I don't know, go into the woods and look at the birds, then you would rightly approach me and say, but hey, you promised to be available. You promised to talk with me. And it would be absurd if I replied to that, no, that wasn't me. That was Sven Brinkman two months ago. And now I'm a new and better version of myself. I'm no longer obliged to do what the old Sven Brinkman promised. promised. Now, because I've paid so much money to my life coach, (laughs) whoever who taught me that I should do whatever I feel like doing and not think of what other people uh, think of me. I mean, that would be absurd. And it illustrates the idea of promising from Nietzsche and the idea of self-constancy from Ricoeur, that without this continuity in our commitments, in ourselves, in our personhood, nothing in the human wor- world can really stick together. And, um, and then I'm worried when I read the self-help books or I look at how you know, we're encouraged to act in our lives by all sorts of uh, psychologists and therapists and, and what have you, who, who, who say that, well, life is about constant development. Life is about changing all the time. Life is about, you know, realizing your potentials. It's not about being the same. It's not about self-constancy. It's about self-development. And in reality, of course, life is about both aspects, self-constancy and self-development. But if you only emphasize one of them, if you only emphasize self-development and forget about self-constancy, then ethical life is no longer possible. Promising is no longer possible. Only a certain kind of, you know, animal-like uh, state is is possible, and we wouldn't want to to reduce ourselves to that. I, I think. So promises, make a promise, keep a promise, even if it's inconvenient, even if it doesn't further your your goal as a as a self. Just make the promise and keep it. If you begin to to ask the question, so keep my promise. Well, what's in it for me? <laughs> then, you know, you can no longer think of yourself as an ethical being. Uh, That's very undignified. If you made a promise, well, then all things being equal, of course, you should do your best to keep it, period. I mean, that's just a basic fact of human life. And uh, it's... It's scary that, 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 that some people even discuss this, I believe. So another philosopher you took a, a standpoint from was uh, Hannah, and I don't know how to pronounce her, I always mess up her life, Arndt, Arndt, Hannah Arndt? Yeah, I, I mean, she was of German descent, so probably Arndt. Arndt, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, her standpoint was, even if there is no truth, man can be truthful. So what does she mean by, even if there is no truth? Because people would say, well, that's, she's just being subjective. She's doing that nihilism. What, what does she mean by that? Yeah, I'm not sure that she actually believes that there is no truth, but she says, well, even if there is no truth, there might be, and there might not be. <laughs> but even if there isn't one, then we can still be truthful. We can still live our lives in a way that commits us to certain things that gives us this kind of self-constancy that I just talked about with reference to recur. So that's a way of arguing in favor of, of these standpoints without committing myself to, you know, a very strong form of objectivism. The idea that these fundamental values just exist outside space and time, outside human life and so on. I don't think they do. I I think there is a certain truth to be found there, but Arendt says, well, even if there isn't such a truth to be found, then this doesn't leave us without standpoints. (laughs) It doesn't leave us without value, non-subjective value, because we can still be truthful. Even if everything happens by chance or by coincidence, well, that doesn't mean that you should act by coincidence, right? This thought also goes back to the ancient Stoics, actually. Marcus Aurelius, the wonderful philosopher, emperor, known mainly today through the movie Gladiator. (laughs) He said that even if everything happens by coincidence, then still you don't have to act yourself by coincidence. And I think that is, that is something uh, worth considering. So one last standpoint I'd like to talk about mm-hmm. from a philosopher uh, is 
Camus, which I thought was interesting because, you know, earlier we were talking about sort of this nihilism of, you know, life is absurd. This is kind of brought up by the existentialists and Camus was one of these guys. Like, like there's, you know, life is, uh, there's no meaning in life. Uh, you make meaning, but you were able to find a standpoint from him. What, what was that standpoint you took from Camus? Yeah, I have quite an ambivalent relationship to the uh, existential philosophers. I think there are, you know, sparks of uh, genius, obviously, in uh, Sartre's works and in the works of, uh, of Camus. But, but especially with Sartre, I think it slides too easily into subjectivism and nihilism. I mean, the idea that we just create value subjectively. It's not there before we live or before we decide that something is valuable. I think Camus is much more sophisticated than that simple form of existentialism. And I also think that he would dislike being referred to as an existentialist. Of course, we can talk about him as an existential thinker. And and people, when we mention those today, uh, address those today, they tend to think of them as, you know, people who saw human freedom as absolute. Human life is about being free without constraints. And then Camus says in one of his articles that freedom is not constituted primarily of privileges, but of responsibilities. And if you have responsibilities in order to be free, then you don't create yourself and your own life and all the values that are important out of nothing. No, you discover in a way that something is already valuable and you already have responsibilities because you already have relationships to other people. And Camus would say that this is not a threat to freedom. On the other hand, it's a precondition for freedom. And I think initially it's a difficult thought to grasp, but I think it's very deep and I think it's very true. If I can return to to Immanuel Kant, we, we talked about him in the context of human dignity. He, he has such a wonderful image of what I mean and what Camus meant in one of his books. He, uh, the, it's a metaphor of the dove, you know, the bird that flies through space and it feels the pressure of the wind on its wings. And Kant imagines that the dove thinks to itself, well, it's okay to, to fly, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like it, but it would be better if I could fly in a vacuum because then there wouldn't be this annoying air that, that, that blocks my free, you know, movement through space. And then Kant says, well, little dove, you forget one thing, namely that if you were in a vacuum, you couldn't fly. You would fall to the ground because it's the air th- that at, 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 at one at the same time, in a way, is, is blocking your free flight, but it's also making it possible, right? So in a vacuum, there is no air, so you just fall to the ground. But, but it's these factors outside yourself that actually resist your free movements through space or through life, if you will, that also enables you to be free and enables you to move around. So if you didn't have responsibilities, if you didn't have commitments, if you were just an atom that looked inside yourself for whatever, you know, motive for what should I do? I don't know. Let, let me feel about it in, inside myself instead of let me think about it. Then you wouldn't be free. Be- you would, o- you would, you would always act coincidentally. Everything could be different. I mean, and, and that's not freedom. That's just a uh, chance. And, 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 and freedom is not the, the same as acting out of, of chance. Uh, freedom is acting in a, a conscious, willed, and responsible way. And, and I think Camus actually articulated that very well. All right. So that standpoint from Camus is like freedom is a standpoint, but it's not the freedom of liquid modernity where there's no restraints. You do whatever you want. It's a freedom that's tied with responsibilities. Yeah. It's what I say a Berlin the the great historian of ideas called positive freedom. He worked with two concepts of freedom or liberty, a negative one and a positive one. 
And the negative one is probably the, the one we have today. And it means that we are free when there are no constraints. I mean, we are free when we are free from demands, constraints, outer structures that impinge on us, or whatever. And that's why he called it negative freedom, because it's a freedom from something. But positive freedom is a freedom to do something. It's a freedom to try to live up to the responsibilities and commitments we have. And I don't think uh, one of these concepts is totally correct and the other is totally wrong. I think our uh, idea of freedom has different sides. It's a complex one. And I think it has both positive and negative aspects, to use the terminology of Berlin. But I think we have forgotten about this idea of positive freedom, that we have, we, we, we are not born free, if you will. Even though a baby has certain uh, preferences, it has certain needs, it has certain desires. And even if all those needs and desires are fulfilled all the time, then we don't think of it as free. That, that's strange because it cannot act. It cannot be responsible. We don't put the baby to jail if it, you know, breaks the law. At least we shouldn't. Uh, and, and why don't we do that? Well, because the baby has not yet become a, an autonomous person that is able to, uh, you know, be responsible for what, uh, he or she does. The baby has no commitments or no responsibilities yet. So we become free when we gain responsibilities in our lives. And that's not, and again, again, uh, the important point is to understand that all these outer demands, constraints, and responsibilities, they're not a hindrance to human freedom. No, they are precondition for human freedom. And I think that is what we need to, to acknowledge. Well, Sven, there's so much more we could talk about. We could have talked about your fellow Dane, Kierkegaard, and his idea. But where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, I, I have written a, a whole lot of, of books, uh, some of them in English. Some have been translated into English. There's actually a trilogy now. We, we talked about the first two in the series, Stand Firm and Stand Points. But there is a third book called The Joy of Missing Out, which is more about how to um, create communities, institutions, um, well, even societies, actually, in which these standpoints uh, become visible, in which we can institutionalize them and, and live accordance, uh, in, in accordance with them. So it's not just an individual project. I, I think that's important. Uh, so those three books... Um, apart from that, I, I tweet <laughs> Sven Brinkman... Uh, but mostly in Danish. Uh, I also have a podcast, a radio program, but also in Danish. So I'm afraid that uh, people have to learn Danish if they want to, to, to listen to my voice. But if they do that, they can actually also read Kierkegaard in the original language. <laughs> so they can follow in the footsteps of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the great existentialist, who learned Danish in order to read Kierkegaard in Danish. So <laughs> it, that's a good goal. I've actually had goals to like learn languages that philosophy, like I want to learn German <laughs> so I can read Nietzsche in German, uh, learn Greek so I can read Aristotle in Greek. All right. So maybe, okay. Get, we'll, we'll tell people take a year, learn Danish and then uh, listen to your podcast. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> All right. Well, well, Sven Brinkman, thanks so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for all your good questions. It's been a, a pleasure and a priv privilege to, to appear here. Thank you.